you know, I never wanted this channel to be about celebrities or public figures, but uh, over the last few years, it's something I found myself touching on more and more, be it as side notes and talking about certain works that I already want to talk about or full, full videos talking about what the heck happened and what I felt about it. And I've done it enough, seen enough content on similar topics that I find myself thinking about the patterns and how these things go down. Because there are really only so many paths available to public figures when controversy strikes. And which path they take is going to have a significant impact on whether or not they are deemed deserving of a second chance. The idea of second chances is something I see brought up frequently, at least in comment responses, whenever I do videos on controversies around individuals, with plenty of commenters saying why some given individual does or doesn't deserve a second chance. Those arguing against are usually coming from a position of what they did was so bad, there should be nothing else, this is the end of the road, which is largely a call based on personal values and therefore one that I don't have any business arguing with in the broad strokes. Whether the fact that Rob Lowe had sex with a 16-year-old in 1988 means you don't feel comfortable watching The West Wing or not, that's a call that only you can make. However, on the flip side of the Second Chances debate, I do often see things which amount to, well, if person X was given a second chance, then person Y should get one too, basically arguing a position that all these occurrences should be handled the same way. And um, if you've been around my channel, even for a little bit, you already know my answer to this. Nothing is ever always. I even got a shirt with that on it. Merch link in the description. Situations can be similar for numerous reasons, but that doesn't make them equivocal. The differences between each instance matters, but it helps to have an approach to try and parse those differences. So here are the questions that I ask myself when these things come up. What is the nature and the credibility of the accusations against the public figure? Is it in line or in contradiction with that person's current public image? Has the public figure responded? If so, has the public figure expressed remorse and how sincere is it? Has the public figure expressed intention to change? How strong is the evidence that such change is occurring or at least being attempted? Now, let me be clear. This isn't a checklist. This isn't something where I expect public figures to answer every question in a specific way that suits me personally. These are just the things that I'm going to be looking for when assessing my own ability to give this person or that person a second chance. Don't worry. I'm going to be going through these, and there will be examples. Mostly from people I've already done videos on, conveniently enough. I'd also like to note that this same list of questions can easily be applied to a corporate entity facing controversy for things like discriminatory hiring or toxic work environments, <coughs> Activision. Though, uh, for the sake of simplicity, I intend to limit most of my examples to individuals. Additionally, I'm going to try to be as fair as possible in the examples I cite, but just realize I'm not here to litigate anybody's actions. I'm here to talk about the cycle of controversy responses to it and how that plays out. I may need to cite examples, but it's not really what we're here to talk about and pick apart. Cool? Cool. The The nature nature and credibility of the accusation. accusation. This first one is pretty straightforward on paper, but it can get very messy very quickly in practice. Basically, we're asking, what is the person accused of and how credible is the accuser or group of accusers? Now, that second part already adds complications because in a one-on-one disagreement, battle lines are going to get drawn very quickly because until things get further along, it's largely going to be one person's word against another. Now, if instead of a single accuser, there is a group of people behind the accusation either issuing similar allegations or issuing statements of support for the initial allegation, it's immediately going to lend more credibility. We kind of saw this happen in real time with the accusations against Joss Whedon and his onset attitude during the shooting of Justice League. Initially, the accusations were pretty much only coming from Ray Fisher. So for a while, 
it was basically one person's word against another. But as time went on, Fisher's co-stars began to express their support for him. And then when people who'd worked under Whedon on other projects began to come forward with their own stories that lined up with what Fisher was saying, it was no longer a simple your word against mine situation. It's also interesting to look at the issue of credibility in relation to Whedon, because oftentimes fans are going to rally around the accused person, at least initially, since they want to believe the best of the person who makes the thing that they like. In the case of Whedon, the fans of DC Films already didn't like him because many of them held him at least partially responsible for how far away the theatrical release of Justice League was from what original director Zack Snyder had hoped to make. So many actually jumped on the Ray Fisher camp much more rapidly than usually happens in such situations. Now, that sort of related question I asked about whether or not the accusations are in line with the public figure's image. It doesn't apply in every case, but I'll give you two quick examples where it does apply. One where things lined up and one where they didn't. In 2016, when audio leaked of then-presidential candidate Donald J. Trump bragging about sexually assaulting women, the traditional view of politics was that this was the end of his campaign. But that didn't happen. And I'd argue that part of the reason that this and many other similar scandals never put a dent in Trump's political aspirations was because all these things were absolutely in line with the kind of person Trump actually purported to be. Accusing someone like Trump of being a bully or objectifying women doesn't carry much weight when nothing about his public persona contradicts those ideas. He was already famous for doing both of those things to varying degrees. Some of the things he was best known for were firing people on television and running a beauty pageant. The people who liked him already decided they were okay with some degree of this behavior, so just upping the degree of it didn't do much to hurt him. On the other hand, Ellen DeGeneres saw her entire brand image nosedive when reports began to leak about a toxic work environment on her popular daytime show, including accusations of cruel and bullying behavior from her personally. The reason these accusations were so damaging had less to do with the severity of the specific instances and a whole lot more to do with the fact that they flew in the face of the be kind to each other mentality that Ellen had built her entire brand on. The issue was less that Ellen was mean to people sometimes than it was that her fans felt lied to and deceived about who she even was by these revelations. Now, so far I've been talking about accusations relating to behavior. Things get a lot messier when controversy instead surrounds a public figure's beliefs. But stick a pin in that. We're going to have to circle back around to it. The Response Next up, how did the public figure respond to the controversy? This one can honestly be what makes or breaks the entire situation. I've noted before that how one responds to accusations has the power to mitigate damage, but it also can make things much, much worse. Funnily enough, this is actually a bigger issue now than it used to be. Back in my day, oh God, I I actually said that. All right, I'm I'm owning it now. Back in my day, before your fancy Twitsters and your YouTubes and your Tiki Togs, I can't keep doing that voice. Uh, But back then, the standard progress of a scandal or controversy was for the public figure to issue a fairly middle-of-the-road statement and then just disappear from the public eye for a bit, often under the guise of some sort of rehab or general self-improvement. This rarely does the trick anymore, And that's because of the joys of social media. Back in the day, when a manager or a PR person, all they had to do when they had a client in trouble is get that public figure away from where the cameras would be and wait for the thing to blow over. It didn't always work, but it was a proven first step at least. If the public figure couldn't say these things to journalists or on camera, then they couldn't make it any worse. But now, unless a manager is able to take away their client's phone completely... The public figure still has access to Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and a ton of other platforms where they are free to speak without a filter, which isn't to say that there aren't still some who know how to stop talking, just that it seems to be a vanishing skill. A solid example of someone who pulled that old school approach off quite well in relatively recent memory was Rosario Dawson. 
In late 2019, Dawson and several members of her family were accused of verbally, emotionally, and even physically harassing and assaulting a transgender man who worked for them. That man went on to file a lawsuit over the whole issue. Dawson, through a statement by her attorney, denied the accusations, but otherwise said nothing. She didn't talk about the case. She didn't talk about the man who accused her. She just did not talk about it. And then... When she was dropped from the lawsuit nearly a full year later in August of 2020, the general reaction seemed to amount to, oh, that that was still going on? Dawson seemed to understand that any statement made was going to be heavily scrutinized, so it was best to simply say nothing at all. That said, she had the slight advantage of this actually playing out in court. So any statements she did feel the need to make could be confined to the court proceedings instead of having to be aired publicly or feeling like they had to be aired publicly. When accusations exist primarily or exclusively in the public arena, then that's usually the only place that you can answer them. It's also worth acknowledging that it's going to be easier for someone like Rosario Dawson to basically go silent because of the nature of her celebrity. As an actress, fans are used to engaging with her work anywhere from a few times a year to once every couple of years because there's downtime between her projects. But for any public figure whose image is heavily dependent on social media, it's going to be much harder and possibly more detrimental to just go silent. So this applies to YouTubers, TikTokers, Instagram influencers, or even authors, actors, or video game developers if they have a high degree of fan engagement through online platforms. If a person's fame and notoriety is even partly due to their online presence as opposed to their actual works, then disengaging from online presence carries a much more substantial risk. But if your fans are used to having access to you and you're not talking about what the scandal is, it looks bad. Flip side is if you keep responding to the controversy, that means you're keeping it in the public eye and are risking saying something that will make it worse. But then if you simply unplug, you've basically completely cut off your entire platform, which may begin hemorrhaging engagement or relevance in the absence of new content. This is why I have alerts on my phone to remind me to tweet something other than, hey, I've got a new video up at least once a day. Because if I don't, it might as well be a faceless corporate account. And I ain't that big yet to be able to be a faceless corporation. Maybe one day. Is that the dream? God, I hope not. Now, this whole thing is probably why online-based celebrities like Logan Paul, Jeffree Star, Shane Dawson, PewDiePie, and others can't seem to stay out of trouble. Simply stepping out of the limelight really isn't an option for them. Their entire celebrity and brand is online. And even if they try and disengage, those online spaces are going to keep talking about them. Was there an apology? We've gone on a while, and that's just on the topic about statements being issued at all. So let's talk about how these controversies get addressed when statements are made. So there's a couple of options that these people have. First, there's the flat denial, simply saying none of this is true, which makes the strongest statement, but is also a bit of a gamble, and it can backfire. Because if a public figure unambiguously denies an accusation and later there turns out to be solid, credible backing behind it, then the public figure gets to add liar onto their list of accusations. And this can happen even if only part of the accusation is found to be true. That's the risk of a hardline denial. It leaves you no wiggle room if it turns out later that at least some bits of this were true. I think that's why you usually only see hardline denials when it comes to the most egregious of accusations. Usually, sexual or violent in nature. Because at that point, the accusation is so bad that admitting fault to even part of it, it simply might not be an option from a PR perspective. Again, unless you're somebody like Trump, who already has nasty behavior as part of his established image, where you get some more wiggle room. Next, there's what I consider to be sort of the industry standard, the non-apology. This is where a statement is made in the style of an apology without actually taking ownership of the action or admitting to any fault. They tend to contain phrases like, I'm sorry if anyone was offended, or I'm sorry people felt that way, which contains the words I'm sorry and acknowledges people's feelings, but does not admit to any fault to the original actions. There's also, I'm sorry that my loved ones have to hear this, or I'm sorry that I've disappointed my fans, which again is 
kind of an apology, but it conveniently, it's not an apology that engages with the actual people who say they've been wronged. Now, these honestly really never help because they're so ubiquitous that the problem with them is they're just easily called out. But they still get deployed because sometimes it's the best option under the circumstances. Of course, if the public figure is flatly denying accusations, then they're not going to apologize at all because it reads as an admission of guilt. Now, if fault is admitted to, then the question becomes, are they admitting to this because there's too much evidence and a mea culpa is kind of their only option? Or are they admitting to this because they genuinely recognize that they've done something wrong? For the former option, let's look at someone like Perez Hilton. Hilton made his name as something of a professional troll, making fun of celebrities in petty and hurtful ways, even outing some celebrities as gay who hadn't come out publicly yet, something he's still never explicitly apologized for. In 2010, Perez teamed with the It Gets Better project on anti-bullying work and put out a video pledging to do better and to no longer harass celebrities as he had previously. Now, there wasn't really specific allegations against him in the news at the time, but the evidence of his bullying behavior was all over the internet. It was quite literally his brand. But the tide was turning against the way he'd been operating, so he opted to pivot. And given that he's done some messed up stuff since then, specifically relating to Lady Gaga and Ariana Grande, it really does appear more like he just thought it was the best move for his career and less like he had much sincere regret. On the flip side, there's the relatively recent allegations against Warren Ellis. Ellis is a writer best known for his comic book works such as Transmetropolitan and Red, along with being the writer for the Netflix series adaptation of Castlevania. In June of 2020, Ellis was faced with allegations from multiple women of various kinds of manipulation, gaslighting, coercion, and emotional abuse. Ellis' response only denied any intent to harm, but he didn't refute the accounts of these women and was pretty forthcoming about his own culpability. He stated that he'd failed to understand the power dynamic at play in his encounters with women and had not recognized how the balance was automatically in his favor due to his standing in the industries that he worked in. If sincere, the response paints a picture of a man who is being made to recognize the reasons why behavior he thought wasn't a problem actually was. At no point did he accuse anyone of lying or trying to ruin him. He immediately stepped away from all his projects, even going so far as to ask DC Comics to not use a story he'd already written and submitted to them for an upcoming anthology. I believe it was Batman. And he's kept quiet since then, ostensibly working on self-improvement through therapy. Now, whether this is a case of sincere regret or someone simply having a better understanding of the current landscape and going farther than usual to take ownership as part of a calculated move to mitigate the damage is frankly impossible to say at this point. But so far, at least, Ellis has yet to do anything that has brought doubt onto his statements. Unlike the somewhat similar situation with comedian Louis C.K., whose reply to accusations of self-exposure came at things from a similar position and amounted to, I didn't recognize that my position of power meant people might say something was okay when it actually absolutely was not. Now, CK has stepped back into the limelight since then, and some feel a bit too quickly since he began appearing on comedy stages less than a year after the major accusations against him. And getting back into that arena that quickly can't help but make some question how sincere his apology was. Having said that, no actual new allegations have occurred so far as I can find. So, how about we shift into... Desire to change. So we've started talking about this with some of the examples already given, but if there is an admission of guilt somewhere, then the question is whether or not the public figure expressed any desire to change their behavior. Now, this isn't going to be the case on most of the more severe accusations of misconduct, but for something that could be painted as either a one-off incident or a pattern of behavior that's now regretted, then there is the possibility of doing better in the future. It's actually pretty rare for public figures to evoke the, it was a mistake I only made one time 
argument, and for pretty good reason. In an age when so much is recorded and it's all searchable on the internet, public figures have learned the hard way that if they claim something only happened once, but that's not actually true, then it's virtually a guarantee that the internet will dig up the other times that it happened. My own favorite example of this is somebody who actually wasn't really a well-known public figure outside of his particular niche corner of the internet, but it's such a perfect example, and furthermore, hilarious, I'm going to use it anyway. Philip Mewson was an internet video game critic who, in 2018, was accused of plagiarizing his review of the game Dead Cells from a channel called Boomstick Gaming. The similarities between his video and Boomstick Gaming's original were undeniable, and IGN, which was employing Mewson at the time, promptly fired him and placed all the work he'd done for them under review to ensure that nothing else looked to be plagiarized. Mewson didn't deny the similarities to Boomstick Gaming's video. I mean, he really couldn't. Everybody could see them. But he tried to claim it was unintentional, and he then did the single stupidest thing he could have possibly done. In his response to all this, while calling out the site Kotaku, which was running its own investigation at the time, he said, and I quote, you can keep looking, Kotaku, and please let me know if you find anything. He dared not only his colleagues in the industry, but the internet at large to find more instances of him plagiarizing work. And guess what happened next? (laughs) Mountains of evidence from years worth of work was unearthed and brought to light. Stuff that probably wouldn't even have been found by Kotaku if he hadn't goaded everybody. So yeah, This kind of thing is why you don't see it only happened that one time used very much as a defense anymore. However, something similar to it only happened one time still does get some use. And that's, well, things went too far. Now, this is the path taken by people like Logan Paul and PewDiePie whenever they get into trouble and need to admit to fault. In both cases, what they got into trouble for, uploading a video of the body of a man who committed suicide and paying people to make him a video of them holding an anti-Semitic sign, respectively, aren't a million miles away from their normal output. Paul was well known for his vlogs depicting the things he did or saw, and PewDiePie had a long history of quote-unquote edgy jokes. So neither could really disown the behavior that led up to these incidents without completely changing their entire image and approach to content. Which is part of why neither apology was taken as very sincere, because there was no recognition of how their behavior, up to the point of going quote-unquote too far, had led them to that point. Only the acknowledgement that they crossed a line. Of course, both have had further controversy since then, but I'm not going down that particular rabbit hole. Uh, Thank you very much. Evidence of change. So that leaves people who make sincere pledges to change, which is a really hard thing to sell because it requires that they actually do change. And more importantly, prove that they plan to keep to those changes even as time passes. And the passage of time is a big factor here. But it's also possibly one of the reasons that mitigating damage is so difficult, because most public figures want to be granted their second chance right away, if only in the interest of preserving their careers. But for many of their fans or former fans, what's needed more than anything is the evidence of time to show that the behavior is changing and that it wasn't a superficial or temporary change. Again, this is more difficult for public figures whose brand and presence is primarily or entirely online, and this is why so many of them and their most ardent defenders basically ask for a second chance up front, like an IOU on the promise that things will improve later. Which, of course, they never do, because if their audience is sticking around anyways, they've basically already forgiven them, so what's the point in changing? They didn't leave. But time can make the world of difference. A good example of this is James Gunn. Gunn is best known as the director of the Guardians of the Galaxy films. But he'd been working in films since the 90s, and that stretch of time ended up causing him problems at first, but ultimately may have been a saving grace. So in 2018... As a retaliation for negative comments Gunn made about President Trump, a conservative blogger dug up and began to spread around a series of tweets Gunn had written making light of such things as 
rape, September 11th, and child abuse. Disney, the parent company of Marvel, fired Gunn, who was preparing to shoot Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. But there was a massive outpouring of support to have Gunn reinstated, something which ultimately did occur. And there were some key reasons why so many people were prepared to vocally defend Gunn. First, the tweets in question all came from a four-year stretch from 2008 to 2012, so none of this was current activity. Secondly, Gunn had actually spoken about these tweets and addressed these kinds of jokes before, admitting that he had been something of an edgelord in the past and was no longer wishing to behave that way. And this, combined with what was at the time a six-year stretch of time where he hadn't made those kinds of jokes, was an extremely strong argument for Gunn being a changed man. It didn't require the kind of leap of faith you get when somebody pleads, give me another chance and I will do better later, because the evidence of time showed Gunn already was doing better. Of course, for every James Gunn or Robert Downey Jr. who can point to years of changed behavior, there's a thousand Logan Pauls or PewDiePie's or Mel Gibson's who just keep reaffirming that they are the exact same person who screwed up years ago. The second chance. So these are the things I try and take into account when I assess if I am now or will ever be able to give a creator or a public figure a second chance. Some, like Bill Cosby or Harvey Weinstein, fall at the first hurdle, where what they did was so atrocious that a second chance shouldn't even be in the cards. Some, like the folks behind Channel Awesome, give an initial response that makes things so much worse than they already were that the hole becomes too deep to climb out of. Some fail to give a sincere apology, or any apology at all. Some fail to back up a pledge to be better. But sometimes, with enough time, even I can move forward. I'll bring up Rosario Dawson again. At the time of her Cassie announcement and involvement with The Mandalorian, I simply wasn't comfortable with the idea of seeing her on screen. I was not ready to support her work. I said this at the time. Recently, I have actually started working my way through the second season of The Mandalorian, and it's fine. But the reason I'm willing to do that is because enough time passed without more evidence or similar issues occurring that I'm ready to at least try and move on. Not to say others have to. The metric you use is yours to determine. I just thought I'd offer up where I'm at with mine with that specific instance. So, I guess that about wraps it up with... Ow, 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 what the... Oh, that's right. We uh, stuck a pin in earlier, didn't we? Controversial Controversial beliefs. I know this thing is running long, but simply put, the pattern for controversial beliefs have some notable differences to those of controversial actions. The biggest being you will almost never see an apology over a controversial belief. The only time people will ever apologize for something they believe is if they no longer hold that belief. But other than that, people are just not going to be comfortable openly contradicting something they do currently believe. And I get that. Because it feels like a betrayal of who you are as a person. That's not to say one's actions aren't a reflection of who they are as a person. But there's more deniability with actions. Or at least self-deniability. Because how many of us have done or said something and thought, oh my god, that's not who I am? Probably all of us at some point. Actions can feel involuntary, heat of the moment, easier to rationalize in our own minds. But beliefs? Beliefs are active. It's something you do on a continual basis in your own mind, if not publicly. So we're naturally far more invested in what we believe than in what we do. It's easy to deny or disown something you've done, but people just don't do it with something they believe. So how does this impact the whole cycle of questions that we've been asking? Well, if the belief wasn't public knowledge in the past, then there's still the issue of whether that belief clashes with the person's public image. J.K. Rowling being a good example. Both in her written work and as a public figure, she'd done a lot of work to foster a sense of inclusivity and acceptance. So when, in 2019, she voiced her support for a woman whose work contract wasn't renewed due to her open and vehement transphobic beliefs, and then followed that up with Rowling's own transphobic essay in 2020, it sent shockwaves through her fandom. 
Not because huge swaths of her fandom were active advocates for trans rights, but because the idea of such exclusionary views violently clashed with what the fans had come to love about her work and her public image prior to that. As mentioned, you are not going to get an apology for a belief any more substantive than I'm sorry that my views are considered controversial. More often, you'll get nothing at all. And silence is often taken as its own confirmation of the beliefs being held, which can actually have some odd side effects. There was a stretch of time when Taylor Swift was frequently cited within alt-right and far-right extremist communities as being secretly reactionary in her views, but that she couldn't talk about it because it would hurt her career. So for years, these people took her silence on political issues as confirmation of this, as opposed to the more likely answer that making any political statement ran the risk of alienating part of her fan base. This was all eventually proven false when Swift endorsed Democrats in the 2018 midterms and has been more outspoken since then. But the reason I cite this is because when it comes to issues of belief, a public figure being silent means that people will take that as confirmation supporting whatever they think that figure believes. A lack of refuting evidence is treated as confirmation, which is messed up, but is also what happens. Because as I noted... The obvious reason for someone to not talk about politics is not wanting to lose part of the audience, since it's almost inevitable that there will be people who like your work but would disagree with you on political issues. From a publicity standpoint, it usually just makes more sense to not talk politics at all, but this tends to incline people to start to project beliefs onto public figures, usually unpopular beliefs paired with the justification that they know they can't say this out loud. Chris Pratt's been going through this cycle for a few years now, and while silence might make sense on a personal level, it can still cause its own issues because people start to wonder, but why are they silent on this issue? So far, controversial beliefs seem to largely remove options from the table. Denials generally don't happen, don't expect an apology, and silence carries different connotations that often make it less viable as an option. So... There's also something that gets added to this whole process. Doubling down. That's where the public figure, instead of taking a position of, I messed up, to some degree or other, opts instead to say, no, I was totally right the whole time, actually. Now, you almost never see this tactic regarding controversial actions and behavior just because it's a bit of a PR nightmare in the wake of, say, accusations of running a toxic work environment for the person to say, yeah, yeah, I was abusive. So what? That's a perfectly valid way to run things. While it's not completely unheard of, it's the kind of thing you really only get from corporations or specific heads of companies. This kind of thing is uh, frighteningly common in video game development. (coughs) Ubisoft, (coughs) EA, (coughs) Activision again. Uh, But while rare on accusations of behavior, doubling down is quite common when it comes to controversial beliefs. Rowling is already an example. Challenged on her apparent support of an openly transphobic person, she eventually doubled down and tried to justify her views with that essay. Gina Carano is another recent example. Carano was on The Mandalorian and kept stirring up controversy on social media, mostly Twitter, with things ranging from what appeared to be mockery of publicly posting pronouns to anti-mass sentiments to questioning the results of the 2020 election until eventually she was dropped not only by Lucasfilm but by her talent agency as well. And since then, she has teamed up with the right-wing organization The Daily Wire, choosing to align herself with an organization that shares her controversial views rather than attempt to mend things with the mainstream. On issues of belief, doubling down is its pretty understandable because it can frankly be suffocating to feel judged over something you feel strongly in the right about. Hell, one could make an argument that my own presentation on this channel has been a protracted case of doubling down on my own femininity. It started in 2018 when I acknowledged my gender fluidity and at the time made an immediate claim that it probably wouldn't be seen too much on this channel Two later, it became prominent when addressing LGBTQ issues in specific, but now, more often than not, I look like, well, a goddess, to be honest. Praise me. Seriously, though, I I get it. When these things matter to you, it feels like the world is saying you're wrong. The natural response is to hold on tighter and fiercer than ever before. Does that mean I'm okay with public figures 
holding, say, misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic, or racist beliefs and doubling down on them? F*** no. I'm just saying I get why they do it. It's because of the sincerity of the belief, which, if the belief is abhorrent, is just kind of all the more damning. Conclusion. Okay, now I think we're done. And I'm not entirely sure what the point of this was. Um... Oh, yeah. Buy my uh, Nothing Is Ever Always merch. Uh, link in the description again. Uh, this is kind of a long-winded way of pitching that, wasn't it? <laughs> in all seriousness, though, what do you think about all this? Are there key examples you want to give? Are there aspects of the asking for a second chance cycle that you think I missed, got wrong? Whatever your thoughts are, drop something down in the comments and let's talk about it. Just be polite. And as I said, don't let this turn into a bunch of arguments about who did or didn't do what. We're not here to litigate the events. Just talk about the cycles. So leave your comments below. I have a Patreon if you really like what I do and want to support and help me keep on doing it. There's also YouTube memberships if you'd rather go that way. No pressure though. Like, share, subscribe is free and that helps me out as well. But you don't have to do that either because at the end of the day, You are the council. I'm only running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned.